This morning we continue our series on the book of Galatians, the letter that Paul wrote to the churches in Galatia. And I'm going to just briefly recap what we did last week where we talked about the true gospel, whether it's law or grace. Sorry, law or promise. And um, Paul put those two um, in juxtaposition. The promise, he said, is eternal. The law is temporary. The promise is directly from God, and the law is through angels and an intermediary who is his servant Moses. The promise gives life, and the law cannot give life. The true gospel, we said, is promise and not law. So the true gospel is then eternal. It is directly from God, and a true gospel gives life. Whereas the law is temporary, it comes through angels and an intermediary, and it cannot give life. And life is what it's all about. Life can only come from God because God is the creator of life and God is the giver of life. And it is through the life that comes from God that we can have life. True life here in, now, in the year and now and eternal life at the end of time as we know it. This morning, Paul is going to continue in his polemic and in his arguments against these Judaizers. The Judaizers who want to go back to the law, who want these Gentile Christians coming to God through faith to now embrace the law. The Judaizers believe that obedience to the law is what brings righteousness. That if you want to be a true child of God, you need to obey God's law. They argue that Abraham obeyed the law of God or obeyed God's instructions through circumcision. They argue that Israel as a people obeyed the law that came through Moses. And it is the obedience from Abraham and it's the obedience from Israel that secures God's blessing upon them. But Paul is going to outflank them. Paul is going to go around and Paul is going to say to them that before Abraham obeyed, he was declared righteous. It was the fact that he believed the promise of God that was counted to him as righteousness. And after that, God said to Abraham, because of this covenant that I'm making with you, I want you to be circumcised as a sign or a seal of this covenant that I've made with you. So first he believed and he was counted righteous. Then he obeyed with circumcision. This is the argument that Paul lays before them. But not only that, he goes further and he says that this righteousness of Abraham was an imputed righteousness and not an imparted righteousness. It was counted to him as righteousness. It was not earned by him as righteousness. Now don't be confused by these words imputed or imparted. It's actually very, very simple. Imputed is kind of like an accounting terminology. It means that in the ledger, on your account, it is marked as a credit to you. It's not something that you own, but it's something that is marked as a credit to you. So the righteousness is not Abraham's righteousness that he owns, that is imparted to him, that is given to him as a gift that he receives and now he has it. And so he is righteous himself. No, he is still a sinner himself. He still falls short of the glory of God. But righteousness is counted to him. On the accounting ledger, it is credited to him. Abraham, righteous. So it's imputed. It's not given to him. It doesn't become his. He's not the owner of his righteousness. But righteousness is imputed to him. It's credited to him 
in the ledger of God. Now, the Jews felt that they had earned righteousness by their obedience to the law over a long period of time. And they were opposed to these Gentiles who were now getting in easy just by faith. Jesus told a parable about this. There was a man who wanted to find workers for his vineyard. And he went out early in the morning and he hired some workers. And they came and they worked on his vineyard and he promised them a denarius if they worked for the whole day. Now a denarius was fair pay for a day because that was a day's wages in those days. So the, the landowner was very fair towards them and promised them a day's wages for a day's work. And they started early in the morning and they worked the whole day. But later in the morning, the landowner decided he needed some more workers, so he went out to the field, or sorry, he went out into town and got more workers to come and work in his vineyard. And they worked from the time when he hired them. And later in the day, he went again, and he hired, and so, off, so forth, until the last people were hired one hour before closing time. So the first people worked the whole day, and the last people only worked one hour. And when it came time to pay these folks, the landowner said to his steward, pay the last guys first. So the people who only worked one hour came for payment and they were given a denarius, which is a whole day's wages. And then he went backwards and he started paying people who worked longer after that. Eventually he came to the people who worked the whole day. And guess what they got? A denarius. A day's wages for a day's work, which was fair, which is what he agreed to them in the beginning. But they grumbled. They were not happy with that. Why were they not happy with that? Well, they felt it was unfair that the other guys who only worked for one hour got the same pay as they got and they worked for the whole day. As they grumbled, they said to him, they said it's not right because we bore the brunt of the sun's heat all day long. You see, we worked hard and we bore the brunt of the, the work and the heat of the sun the whole day. They only came for one hour. You can't give them the same as you gave to us. And the landowner turned around and he answered them. He says, I'm not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I'm generous? You see, God is a generous God. And if God decides that He's going to give these Gentiles who came in lately the same blessing, the same reward the same inheritance as those folks who had been under the law for thousands of years. If God decided to do that, if He was going to be that generous, who are these Jewish believers now to grumble about that? But they did, you see, and that's what Paul was addressing. Now, Let's turn this to our passage today and see how Paul does this. I'm reading from Galatians chapter 3, verse 23 to 4, verse 7. Before the way of faith in Christ was available to us, we were placed under God by the law. We were kept in protective custody, so to speak until the way of faith was revealed. Let me put it another way. The law was our guardian until Christ came. It protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. And now that the way of faith has come, we no longer need the law as our guardian. 
For you are all children of God through faith in Christ, Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ, like putting on new clothes. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. Think of it this way. If a father dies and leaves an inheritance for his young children, those children are not much better off than slaves until they grow up, even though they actually own everything their father had. They have to obey their guardians until they reach whatever age their father set. And that's the way it was with us before Christ came. We were like children. We were slaves to the basic spiritual principles of this world. But when the right time came, God sent His Son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent Him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law, so that He could adopt us as His very own children. And because we are His children, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are His child, God has made you His heir. See what I did there? I put the last three U's in yellow to draw your attention to that. Because in the English it's difficult to see, but those three are singular use. So Paul is now speaking to an individual person, saying, you, please know that you are God's child. Please know that you are an heir to what God has promised, to everything that God owns. Everything before he was talking in a plural you, talking to them, to the Galatians, but now he's making it so personal. This is for you. I want you to know that you are God's child. I want you to know that you will inherit everything that your father owns. This is important. Let us pray. Father God, thank you so much for your word. I pray you are blessed to us. I pray that you bless me and use me today to, um, to speak and to open up this text in a way I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would make clear to us. Even if I stumble over my words, Lord, I pray that you would make it clear to us in our minds and in our hearts. This is so important. This is so basic to who we are and who you want us to be and who you have made us to be. You have called us to be your sons and daughters. So I pray, Lord, that this would be a message that would strike us deep, deep, deep inside of ourselves. I ask us in Jesus' name. Amen. This is indeed the basics of the faith. At the heart of our faith is the fact that you and I have been adopted as God's children. Paul is going to open this up. He's going to argue this twice over. His whole argument in chapter 3 so far has been to let the Jews know that the Gentiles have come in by faith and they who are Jewish believers can also only come in by faith. But he's going to conclude those arguments now with these two uh, propositions or assertions, conclusions that he makes. The first one is that they are going to be children of Abraham. And that is from verses 23 to 29. And then he's going to reinforce that with the second conclusion, verses 1 to 7 from chapter 4, where he's going to argue that they are children of God. 
You are children of Abraham and you are children of God. You're going to inherit Abraham's promises and Abraham's blessings and you're going to inherit from God God's promises and God's blessings. He reinforces that because both of those tell us how the Gentiles and the Jews are related to God and how they inherit from God. In verses 23 to 29, he says, You are children of Abraham and you are heirs of his promise. He says in verse 24, he says, let me put it another way. The law was our guardian until Christ came. It protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. And now that the way of faith has come, we no longer need the law as our guardian. Yes, the law was there as a guardian, but now Christ has come, faith has come. We no longer need the law as our guardian. Now we will be related through faith. He says, for you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. It might be that he's referring here to the toga virilis, which is the, the toga that um, young people, young men would wear in the Roman Empire when they become of age. And normally it's just age 13. Sometimes it could be up to age 15, but this 13 to 15 was the time when they would become of age. And they would no longer be under a guardian. And they would no longer wear the clothes of a child. But they could put on this toga of a man. They would be considered to be uh, uh, the age of majority. And so they would become a man and they can put on this. So it could be that Paul is referring to that, yeah, putting on Christ. No longer a child under the guardian, but now a fully uh, developed person, a, a person who has reached the age of majority, now a person of faith, putting on Christ. Now he says, no longer any Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. So he takes us back to Abraham. That's his first conclusion that he does in, in, the, in uh, verses 23 to 29. You Jews and Gentiles are through faith now children of Abraham, because Abraham is the father of our faith. Now, this, being children of Abraham and being heirs of the promise, is not a new plan that Paul is proposing. It's not a new religion. It's not a replacement of Israel. No, this is the original plan. This is the promise. The plan was never for Israel alone. The plan was always going to be expanded. That was God's promise to Abraham. That he would be the father of many nations. That all the peoples of the earth would be blessed through him. That's through his seed, which Paul argued is Christ. That is why God changed his name from Abram to Abraham, so that it would be a constant reminder of this promise. Let's look at this schematically. We have Abram, who is called by God out of Ur of the Chaldeans. And he, uh, he follows. He's obedient to God. He listens to God's voice. He trusts God. And he leaves his home to go to a land that God would show him. Then God gave him a promise of a son. Isaac becomes the son. Someone from his own flesh. And not only does God promise him a son and many descendants that will come from the son and the great nation that will come from the son, but God also promised him a land, the land of Canaan. This is, these are the promises God gives to Abram. But all of these, I want to argue this morning, were types. All of these were transitory, temporary. 
These were not the end goal. These were not the end fulfillment of the promises that God gave to Abram. But these were types. These were signposts along the way to where God wanted to go, to what God wanted to do in and through Abram. So he, he gives him the promise of a son and the promise of a land for, for his son's descendants. But then he changes his name to Abraham. He says, no longer will you call, be called Abram. <clears throat> You're going to be Abraham. I'm changing your name because I'm, your destiny is much bigger than just having Isaac and just having one people and Canaan. The true son, what the type is pointing towards, the reality that is coming, that the signposts are pointing towards, is Christ. He is the seed, your seed, that I'm promising to you. Paul makes this very clear. Paul stands on this firmly, that Christ is the seed. He is the son of promise. Yes, Isaac was a son of promise, but Isaac was the type. Isaac was the signpost, the one that points to the real one that's coming, which is Christ. And the land of Canaan was pointing to the real inheritance given to Abraham, which was, wasn't just one country or one area, but the whole world. God's promise to Abraham was through Isaac and Canaan, in time, or as a type, but then ultimately it was through Christ and is giving him the whole world. Let's see what Paul writes here in, oh sorry, let's read here in Joshua. It says, So the Lord gave to Israel all the land he had sworn to give their ancestors, and they took possession of it and settled there. What does that mean? It means that the land of Canaan, the land that God promised to, to Abraham, he had given that to him and to his descendants. All the land that God promised, he had given already. And they took possession of it and settled. And the Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had solemnly promised their ancestors. None of their enemies could stand against them, for the Lord helped them conquer all their enemies. Not a single one of all the good promises the Lord had given to the family of Israel was left unfulfilled. Everything he had spoken came true. All the promises that God gave to Abram came true. Isaac was born. Descendants came. God made a people of them and God took them to Canaan. And they conquered the land. And they settled in the land. All these promises were true. They were all fulfilled at this time in the Old Testament. But what I'm arguing this morning, what I want us to understand this morning is that these promises and, and, and what was fulfilled, these were only types. This was not the end of the story. These types, these signposts were pointing to the real promises which came through Jesus Christ. God even, Paul writes this, he says, Clearly, he says, God's promise to give the whole earth to Abraham and his descendants was based not on his obedience to God's law, but on a right relationship with God that comes by faith. Paul is writing to the Romans and he says, yes, God promised Canaan, but actually God promised the whole earth in his promises to Abraham. Canaan was always going to be the type. It was going to be the signpost. Yes, God fulfilled that. He gave them that land. But that was a deposit. That was a first fruit of the whole earth that God had promised. But this whole earth wouldn't come through Isaac. This whole earth wouldn't come through the Jewish people. The whole earth would come through Jesus Christ, who in himself would bring in people from every tribe, nation, and tongue. The type and the signpost was fulfilled at its time. But in the right time, the bigger promise and the, and, and the real reality of what God has given in Christ was fulfilled. 
In verses 1 to 7, he's giving the same argument, but he's now reinforcing that, but he's now actually opening it up, not just the children or the heirs of Abraham, but the children and the heirs of God. You see how he expands that now. He says, think of it this way. If a father dies and leaves an inheritance for his young children, those children are not much better off than slaves until they grow up, even though they actually own everything uh, their father had. They have to obey their guardians until they reach whatever age their father set. And that's the way it was with us before Christ came. Now, many of us, when we uh, draw up a, a last testament or, or a will, uh, we put in there, our children should inherit from us, and, and many times we would put a, an age there if they are young children. We would say, when they're 21 years old, or when they're 25 years old, or we'll put an age there, and we'll say, if I should pass away before they are that age, then I appoint trustees who will take care of the inheritance until that time, until they reach that age. And whenever they reach that age, then they will inherit everything. And Paul is saying that, and, but that even though these sons were going to inherit everything, they weren't ready to inherit everything yet. They were still young, and they still had to be under a guardian. But when the right time came, when the time of faith came, that guardianship was finished. Now they were ready to inherit everything. And he's going to argue that that's Christ, the time of Christ. He says, that's the way it was with us before Christ came. We were like children. We were slaves to the basic spiritual principles of this world. And that basic spiritual principles are you know, the powers and principalities. These are basic uh, entities that people would believe would be in control of the world. He says, but when the right time came, God sent His Son, born of a woman, subject to the law. When the right time came. What is the right time? It's the time to end the law. It's the time to end Torah. And the time for us to enter into our majority. The time to move from being a child, a minor child, to going to majority and to be able to inherit. He says, God sent His Son... Very interesting that the son was sent and then he was born of a woman. He was sent from where? He was sent from, from heaven. He was sent from God himself. You see, the son pre-existed his birth on earth. Paul is saying that God sent him and as he sent him, he was born on the earth, born of a woman, born as a human being. God's Son pre-existed. God's Son is God Himself. God's Son was with Him. But when He sent Him to be born of a woman, He became a human being. God's love is such that He comes to us. He's not sitting in heaven waiting for us to come to Him. But He comes to us. He comes to reveal Himself through His Son to us. Son was sent uh, uh, from God. He was born of a woman and He was subject to the law. Which means He was born as a Jewish person. He is a Jewish Messiah. And because He was born under the law, he could then redeem us from the law. It says God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. What was God's plan? God's plan was adoption. Adoption for you and for me. That's why he sent his son so that he could redeem us from the law. So that he could pay the price to set us free. It says so that he could buy freedom for us. Because we were in slavery, in bondage, under a guardian, held captive. 
couldn't free ourselves. But Christ could come. And He could pay the price for our freedom to set us free. So that we can be adopted as His very own children. This is the most wonderful news in all the world. That God sends His Son to earth to set us free so that He can adopt us as His children. Adopted. Not out of pity, but to become heirs. To inherit. You see, in those days, in the Roman Empire, it is said that at least half of the people who inherited were adopted. The Roman society didn't have many children in those days. The, the high society had very, very few children. And so they always, well not always, but in many, way, many times, they ended up wanting to leave their estate and wanting their name to be carried on, but not having an heir. And so they would adopt. And so I'm told that at least half the people who inherited were adopted. It was a very common occurrence. And so when Paul uses this terminology, because there's a technical term for that, that person who is adopted, when he uses that, the, these hearers would know what he's talking about. The person is adopted as a son, not because the adopter was feeling pity for the person being adopted. This is not someone who's an orphan and they want to adopt him because they feel sorry for that person. No. The whole idea of the adoption is to have an heir. So it's very selfish, really. The person adopts someone to take their name, to inherit their estate, and to carry on their legacy. So when Paul uses this terminology, then he makes it clear that they, yeah, that God is not adopting us because we are orphans and He feels sorry for us and He has pity on us. No, He adopts us so that we could be true sons who could be heirs of God. Secondly, we are adopted not only because, uh, because we need to be heirs, but we also adopted as part of a beautiful plan that God has. It's not an afterthought, but it is God's plan. Our adoption was always God's plan A and never God's plan B. We read in Ephesians, Paul writes, he says, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for this glorious grace that he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He planned to adopt us. He planned before he made the world, that he would do this. John Piper comments on this and he says, Adoption in God's mind was not plan B. He predestined us for adoption before the creation of the world. Plan A was not lots of children who never sin and never need to be redeemed. Plan A was creation for redemption and adoption so that the full range of God's glory and mercy and grace could be known by His adopted children. Adoption was not second best. It was planned from the beginning. God's plan was always for us to end up being His children. But we are adopted through Christ. You see, Christ is the true Son. Christ is the righteous one. Christ is the one 
who loves the Father more than any of us, and Christ is the one who is obedient to the Father even unto death. And when we come to God through Christ, we are adopted as God's children. God has a Son, Jesus Christ, and whoever of us who are in the Son now become the adopted children of God. That is why Paul says when we are in Christ, when we are baptized into Christ, when we clothe ourselves with Christ, when we are in Christ, we become the adopted sons and daughters of God. And heirs, and Paul writes, even co-heirs with Christ. We will inherit, not because of anything that we have done, but we will inherit because we are sons. And when I say sons, I don't mean just men. But what I mean is, a son is someone who will inherit. That's a, uh, uh, the way it was back in the day was the, the firstborn son was the one that would inherit the, 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 the family business. The one who would inherit the legacy, the name, the estate. Would, the firstborn son would, would be the one through whom the line runs. And Christ is the firstborn of all creation. He's not called firstborn of creation because he was born first. No, he's called firstborn because it's a technical term that the firstborn is the one who inherits everything. So Christ will inherit everything. And when we are in Christ, we will share in that inheritance. We will be co-heirs with Christ of everything. The whole world, the whole shebang. Not just Canaan, but everything. This is the most wonderful news of God. Now I'm going to close. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this idea of us being God's true children. Paul's arguing two ways. He's saying we are true children of Abraham through Christ because Christ is Abraham's seed. And therefore we will inherit Abraham's promises. And those promises we looked at earlier on was a, a type, was Isaac and Canaan, but the reality was Christ and the whole world. These were the promises given to Abraham, and we are going to be part of that. And then Paul argues, reinforcing that, that we are the true children of God, because when we are in Christ, then we have become those who will inherit from God Himself because God has adopted us as His sons and daughters. Brothers and sisters, this is the heart of the Gospel. That God has predestined. God, before the creation was made, God has decided that He wants to adopt you and me. Paul uses a singular language when he says, you are a child of God. You have been adopted, and you will inherit. But what does this child look like? Sometimes we think a true child of God is someone who doesn't sin, does everything right, walks the straight and narrow. But I wonder about that. If I look at some of the Old Testament examples that we have, the famous children of God, I ask myself, what sets them aside? Abraham. Do you think of Abraham as this goody two-shoes who just walked the straight and narrow, never did anything wrong? Never did anything good or anything bad? <laughs> what about Moses? Does he strike you as that kind of person? Now that we're on the topic, what about David? Do you think of David like that? A true son of God, a man after my own heart. Is he a person that just doesn't do anything wrong? It's just... What about Elijah? Elisha? Isaiah? Jeremiah? We can go through the scriptures, the Old Testament... What does a true child of God look like? 
Let me tell you, a true child of God is someone who does stuff for God. Someone who has a heart for God. Someone who loves God more than anything else. Someone who is committed to God. Someone who serves God and someone who, who is going to place God first in their life. They might have mistakes that they make. But they're not just going to sit and twiddle their thumbs and hope they don't do anything wrong. In the New Testament, what does a true child of God look like? Think about John the Baptist. How does he strike you? Peter. Paul. <laughs> or even Jesus. If God just wanted Jesus to be sinless, he could have just sat at home and not gone anywhere, not done anything, and just make sure he doesn't, doesn't sin. That wasn't what his life was like. His life was courageous. His life was a life of doing things for God. Of laying his life down for God's people. Of bringing in God's kingdom. The true child of God is someone who is related to God through Christ, who is adopted as a son or a daughter because they are in Christ. Someone who trusts God. Someone who is filled with God's Holy Spirit. Someone who leads a life of worship, of gratitude, and of joy. The point is that a true child of God is someone who trusts Christ, who remains in Christ and becomes more and more like Christ. Paul writes to the Corinthians, and I'm going to close with this now. He says, For all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. And through Christ, our Amen, which means yes, ascends to God for His glory. It is God who enables us, along with you, to stand firm for Christ. He has commissioned us. And He has identified us as His own by placing the Holy Spirit in our hearts as the first installment that guarantees everything He has promised us. It is the Spirit of God that He has placed in us that cries out, Abba, Father. It is the Spirit of God that confirms with us, with our spirit, that we are the true ch children of God. Let us pray. Father God, I thank You for Your Word and I thank You for this wonderful promise that came through Jesus Christ, that we will be adopted as sons and daughters, and that we would inherit the whole earth. Oh Lord God, as we think about this, it is such a great mercy, such a great grace that you have shown us. We can never thank you enough. I thank you, Lord, that you fill us with your Holy Spirit who helps us to relate to you in a way that is different from the law. To relate to you in a personal way so we can cry, Abba, Father. Because we are true children of our Father in heaven. Lord, I pray that as true children, we would not be obsessed without, with the law and with sin and with not doing anything wrong, but Lord, that we would be obsessed with your glory, with your worship, so that your will will be done, Lord, here on earth as it is in heaven. 
so that your name will be glorified. Lord, I pray for your kingdom to come. I pray for your will to be done. And I pray, Lord, that you would use us through your Holy Spirit. I ask in your holy name. Amen.